Hey John, this video is brought to us by Headphones.com. I'll be back later in the video to tell you more about it, but if you can't wait that long, click the link in the description box below. Okay, see you later. How do we set up an entry-level, beginner-level hi-fi system? Now, I tackled this in a video a couple of weeks ago, but the twist with that video was that I used components from the 90s. So I used Mission loudspeakers, a Rotel amp, and a Marantz CD player. And I thought it would be good to do a follow-up video using components that are available today, so like modern retail components, if you like, so not vintage gear. Now, as I've proved before, anybody can put together a video suggesting components, you know, that sum to, I don't know, roughly a thousand euros or a thousand dollars and say, this is a good hi-fi system. And it's one thing to theorize, but it's another thing completely to actually do it. So to get those components, put them together and to take a listen, which is what we're going to do in this video. Now, of course, this isn't the only way to build an entry-level hi-fi system in 2021, but this is the way that I've done it. So we start with the loudspeakers. Now, because in my previous video, in my 90s vintage entry-level hi-fi setup video, I had Mission loudspeakers, I thought it would be really interesting to see what Mission are offering at the entry-level today. So I bought a pair of LX2 Mark II. And you can see they look a little bit similar in sort of design topology to the 760i that I had in the previous video. So you notice how the mid bass driver, this thing here, is above the tweeter. The ports though are not on the front, they're on the back now. And we have magnetic grills instead of clip-ons. And I think that's much nicer, just be able to take them on and off really, really easily. Now, if you're new to all of this hi-fi business, you might be wondering why these patterns here and here around the drivers. And they're implemented to scatter any reflections that might otherwise come off a more uniform surface. Another nerd note is that Mission, since I think the 90s, have adopted computer modeling to develop their loudspeakers. So the bracing inside of here was computer modeled. So they're not just hitting and hoping, they've actually you know, analyzed the internals of the speaker with a computer and worked out where to put the bracing and some of the, um, the stuffing. Is that the right word, stuffing? No, that's not the right word, but whatever. And computer modeling was also used apparently for the crossover, which for those people that know about these kinds of things is fourth order Linkwitz Riley. Now in terms of sound, this is a more lean in, exciting speaker than the 760i, which I know sounds kind of a, a little bit unbelievable. However, it does trade in a little bit of the 760i's speed for a bit more refinement. So this sounds like a, a more accomplished loudspeaker. It has a slightly richer mid bass and there's just more weight in the bottom end. Furthermore, this one plays louder. So with the 760i with the vintage 90s loudspeaker, it starts to sound a little bit strained as you crank the volume. Not so with this model. And this is definitely a better loudspeaker than that 760i. I know some people sort of cling to the idea that vintage sounds best, as if speaker designers are going backwards since the, you know, the 70s and 80s, which is absolutely not true in this particular case anyway. Because, yeah, this speaker sounds much, much better to me than the 760i. <laughs> However, I would say that what ties the sort of vintage mission with this modern day mission together is mid-range transparency. These are both very mid-range focus speakers. This one probably even more so than the older model. So we can definitely see how this new mission shares some of the DNA of the, the mission from 30 years ago, you know, with the, the driver arrangement. 
but this one, it's a bit heavier than the 760i. It feels, well, yeah, when a speaker's heavier, you feel like you're getting more for your money, don't you? Now, in terms of specs, this is 87 dB. It's eight ohm nominal, not six. So that means it should present a very easy load to most amplifiers. However, the tweeter here, it can get a bit lively at times. So we do not want an amplifier that plays to that liveliness. We want to bring it in a little bit. We want to control it. So. Now there are no amplifiers inside the mission loudspeakers, so we need an outboard amplifier like this one. This is an integrated from NAD. And this, think of this as like the modern version-ish of the classic 3020 from back in the day. Now the main advantage of having an integrated in 2021, and I guess for the last decade or so, is we get a remote control, which we didn't have with the vintage Rotel in my last video. What we do have is a nice low profile amp like the Rotel, defeatable tone controls here, balance, volume. The source selection are uh, illuminated press switches and this amp, just like the Rotel, has a built-in MM phono stage. On the back, only one set of binding posts. For me, I don't care about having two sets of binding posts. I never did when I started out and I don't now. Why did I choose this amp? Well, firstly, <laughs> is because I already had it around the house, but also th this does prove to be a very good fit for the missions. Also, th the reason I bought this in the first place was because it's very good at keeping a lid or keeping good control of more ebullient tweeters, which we tend to find crop up more often at the entry level. So this is 40 watts per channel. Sounds like a lot more, it's class AB. I'm not against class D, but I think class AB and it's slightly warmer sound. This is a warmish kind of amp a little bit. That works well with the mission loudspeakers liveliness in the top end. But perhaps my favorite quality of this amplifier is that it sounds very robust, as Germans would say, very robust. It's very strong with dynamics, has lots of punch. Lots, especially for the price point. I mean, I, I love this amp. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And even though I'm gonna give the missions away on my Patreon, this one is staying with me. The mission loudspeakers sell for 277 euros per pair. My chosen amplifier today, 399. Generally speaking, I find that amplification at the entry level now costs more than the loudspeakers. Welcome to the part of today's video where we talk about the sponsor, Headphones.com. What you might not know about Headphones.com is that they're the world's largest online headphone retailer. They sell products from a broad range of manufacturers. They've got you covered with open back headphones, closed back headphones, in-ear monitors, desktop amps and decks, portable amps and decks, portable music players, and so much more. And best of all, they offer 365 day returns. Amazing, right? You have a whole year to make sure you're happy with your purchase. For more information, click the link in the description box below. Now, back to the video.
We're not in the 90s anymore, so we're not going to use a CD player today. We're going to use a network streamer, which I actually introduced in my previous video. This Fisher Price looking thing is the Alo Boss 2 player. Basically, inside there's a Raspberry Pi 4 and then Alo's own DAC board, which is built with audiophile sensitivities. Those sensitivities fall beyond the scope of this video, so if you want to know more about those, I'll put a link in the description box below. This comes with a, a micro SD card fully loaded with Mood OS, or is it Moody? It's M O D E. I don't know how you say that, Mood or Moody, whatever. I, I'm not a big fan of Moody's sort of default web interface player. It's not quite as accomplished as Volumio, but I think most beginners will be excited by the fact that Spotify is up and running pretty much out of the box. You have to click one switch as is squeeze light. So you can use this as a virtual squeeze box for those of you that remember Logitech and Slim Devices squeeze boxes. So this does many things. If you want to use Rune, you can, but you have to add it via secure shell and command line. Now that sounds a bit daunting. It's really not. It's just copy and pasting three commands. Again, for those instructions, I'll put a link, guess where, in the description box below. Just like a CD player, we have to connect this to our amplifier here. We use an analog interconnect. I'm using the Evergreen from AudioQuest. In my last video, I said that Americans sometimes call these analog interconnects cinch cables. That's not true. It's actually Europeans that call them cinch cables, especially Germans. Anyway, to beat the sound, to beat, not like it's competition, but to best the sound of this rather odd looking player, you would have to add something like the AudioQuest Cobalt or the THX Onyx to a Raspberry Pi 4. And you would probably get more resolution from a source device if you did that. But those two setups, so the AudioQuest DAC with the Pi or the THX DAC with the Pi, wouldn't be quite as dark as the Alo Boss 2 player here. Now you might think dark is a bad thing, but it's actually not. Because it, what it does is it, it takes the possibility of hearing that slightly sort of glary lower treble. It puts it in a box and it puts it at the bottom of the ocean. So this never, 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 never sounds glary at all. It, we get none of that sort of digital feeling. And that's why I really like the sound of this. It's just a, such a pity. It looks so cheap and nasty. I hate to say it because a lot of people will be put off by that, but this is a terrific, terrific sounding Raspberry Pi based network streamer. And it's a great fit for our system today because this thing's a little bit warm, this thing's a little bit dark, and together these two devices stop the Mission Tweeter from running away with itself, from being too insistent or too there. The other advantage that the Allo streamer has over dongle DACs added to Raspberry Pi 4s is that we get a remote control. It does do volume, but I use the volume on the amp here. But what we also get is a little mini display which tells us IP address and things like that, which is very useful when you're trying to control this device from a web browser. But we also get, if we click the right button, more advanced settings, including filter settings. So this is like the tweaky geeky area of this network streamer. Now the filter settings make much more of a pronounced difference to the sound than I really expected. A bit like with the, the Denifrips Aries 2 DAC. So we can tweak the sort of the, the, the top end extension to taste because we have fast roll off, slow roll off. I prefer the slow, but some people might prefer the fast. There are a couple of other options here which I'm not going to go into, but we have customization. Very slight, but we don't get that with a Dragonfly or with a THX DAC. And if we consider this like a hi-fi meal, we can use the filter settings and the other settings on here to salt our meal to taste to our own particular preferences because everybody has their own, yeah, their own taste in things.
how does our 21st century entry-level hi-fi system compare to the pseudo vintage 90s hi-fi system? Well, this one, the modern one, it images better. That means it puts players on a virtual soundstage more, more obviously. I mean, it's not super crisp or anything like that, but it's still more cleanly drawn than with the vintage gear. But the new system is more impactful with drum hits. It has more weight and heft moving into the room. It actually drives the room better. The soundstage is bigger, both in width and in height. It sounds like a much bigger loudspeaker system, but it's not as fast. It's not as nimble. So I think the Mission LX2 Mark II, I won't say they're more sluggish. It's just that they, because they have more weight in the bottom end, I guess that sort of illusion of speed is compromised a little bit. And because we have a streaming front end, not a CD player, it's more functionally ambidextrous. Now this system behind me, including the speaker stands and the cables, comes in at roughly a thousand euros, maybe a little bit more. And that's the same price as a pair of KEF LSX. I did do the comparison, albeit briefly. This is a much bigger sounding system. I think it would play much bigger in larger rooms. The KEF sounds smaller, more, more constrained, although it does image a lot better, I think, because of the coaxial driver. But a separate system like this, so basically separate loudspeakers, separate amp, separate streaming DAC, all connected with cables, is more physically intrusive than a streaming active speaker like the LSX. However, it's much easier to connect a turntable to the system because remember the NAD amplifier has a built-in phono stage. So if you're into vinyl, yeah, I think separates are the way to go, generally speaking. But there's no doubt about it, this is a kick-ass sounding hi-fi system for relatively little money. And I love discovering things like this. So there's much more joy to be had in finding terrific sound quality at lower price points. And I do love covering it, I really do. But I also love covering more expensive stuff and it is such a shame that in the comment section, those more expensive pieces are met with, you know, occasional bouts of hostility. Because we can ask ourselves, is this all you need? And we've been here before, haven't we? Link up here. For most people, the answer will be yes. They'll buy something like this, they'll live with it, and that is all they need. For other people, this kind of system will serve as a catalyst for them going deeper and further into the audiophile world. And that, wait for it, that might include more expensive gear. So I think it's best to think of this separate system a bit like that sort of young and fruity and very affordable supermarket wine that you kind of get frustrated by when it's discontinued or the stock runs out. Because just like that bargain supermarket wine, this, this separate system at a roughly a thousand euros, this is where diminishing marginal returns kick in. So I hope this video inspires you to go and do some work of your own, because I can't do it for you. I hope it inspires you to go out and build your first hi-fi system. It doesn't have to be these particular items. This is just a system that I compiled, which I think is very, very good for the money. So if you like this video, please hit the like button down below. If you like my attitude towards high-end audio in that, sometimes it's expensive gear, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's super affordable like this. If you like that, then please subscribe to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. Some of you fine people are still asking what this is and why I have it on the top of some of my gear. The answer lies in the description box below.